Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Taiwan Studies Program New Book Talk Series, our first of the academic year, uh, as well as a special Halloween edition of <laughs> Haunted Modernities, uh, plenty of ghosts and spectral spirits to be discussed today. My name is James Lin. I am Associate Chair of the Taiwan Studies Program and Assistant Professor of Taiwan Studies at the University of Washington. Anru is Professor of Anthropology at John Jay College at the City University of New York. Um, her research focuses on the Asia Pacific region and issues of capitalism, modernity, gender and sexuality and urban anthropology. Her first book was In the Name of Harmony and Prosperity, Gender and Labor Politics in Taiwan's Industrial Restructuring, uh, a book that I continue to use in my classes. Oh. Yes, um, and she is also uh, co-editor of Women in the New Taiwan, Gender Roles and Gender Consciousness in a Changing Society. Today, we have the honor of having her talk about her new book, Haunted Modernities, Gender, Memory and Placemaking in Post-Industrial Taiwan, published by University of Hawaii Press 2023. Uh, we also have a slightly different format for our book talk today, if you're used to uh, how we've been doing book talks in the past. Uh, we have the honor of having uh, professor Sasha Wellen here, who is a uh, professor and chair of the Department of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, uh, author of A Thousand Miles of Dreams, The Journeys of Two Chinese Sisters, as well as Experimental Beijing, uh, Gender and Globalization in Chinese Contemporary Art. Um, professor Wellen will serve as an interlocutor and discussant uh, for uh, part of our book talk today. Uh, without further ado, let us please welcome Professor Anru Lee. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here to uh, share my book with you. And we didn't plan it on Halloween, it just so happened. So <laughs> call it a divine uh, intervention. Uh, so today, um, my book actually is a very small story. And I think for a lot of uh, uh, Taiwanese academics, they actually, all Taiwanese actually know about the story, but know about the story from sort of an angle, um, particular angles. And what I try to do is to provide new angles uh, uh, and then combining, uh, kind of drawing together uh, different clusters of literature that we oftentimes talk separately and hopefully to provide a new perspective in understanding the story itself, but also through the story to understand uh, um, uh, recent development and important issues in Taiwan. Um, so, <clears throat> This is uh, the book cover. I'm very proud of it. Um, the book cover, and I, I like it very much. And it just so happened that uh, this, uh, the actually it was a poster of uh, a one a year, one uh, the poster, a prom promotion poster of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the event, right? And, and held by the uh, Labor Bureau of Kaohsiung City in one year. I just found it online. And, and to put together this poster, they actually called for uh, old photos. So what you are seeing here is that each individual photos, if you look closely, it is uh, women workers working export processing zones 40, 30 years ago. And so it was, it's very apt. And, and so they just, gave me the right to use the poster and uh, for my cover without any cost and very grateful uh, to them. Um, so the story actually takes place in Kaohsiung city, which is the, uh, well, the largest city in Southern Taiwan, right? Taipei is on top uh, uh, of the island and, 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 and Kaohsiung is in the South. And the particular story is, uh, or the, the, what I am going to talk about is actually a, a, a ferry incident and, and happened in 1973. In that ferry incident, uh, 25 young women died, aging from 13 to 30. And 24 out of 25 of them actually worked at export processing zones. So they were first generation of industrial workers in Taiwan that made the Taiwanese uh, Taiwan miracle happen, right? And so they all lived at a very small village here. This is the island of Qijin outside Kaohsiung, right? And so their village was near here. And to call it an island actually, it's sort of, it, it's a fact now, but, but uh, in the 1970s, the island actually was attached to uh, the, the island, well, the, the mainland, the mainland of Taiwan, right? And, but because of the expansion of Kaohsiung Harbor, basically the, the, the government decided, okay, we're going to severe the uh, connection because we need to expand the Kaohsiung Harbor. harbor. So my story is 
as much about ghosts as about spatial sort of reconfiguration. And so these ghosts or these women actually moved around and were moved around and their gra graves, their ghosts, right? The ghosts actually also were moved around, are um, moved around by living people and primarily for the uh, reason of capital accumulation money. So, so I think and that, that is, uh, probably the angle I would like to offer to read from this ghost story to a much larger issue that affects Taiwan and as well as uh, globally. Okay. And uh, if, uh, in a nutshell, if I want to introduce my book, say this is my book, then I probably will start from here. Haunted Modernities is the title of the book, conceptualizes the entanglements of memory space and time by elucidating how history and memory are not simply about the past, but rather emerge from the social, political, or economic needs of the present legitimized and validated by uh, through an association with the past, right? So you can read the book as it starts with something that is history or that was history, and then it turned into memory at some point, right? And then it turned into heritage at the current time. But we know that heritage doesn't stop as being heritage. Heritage usually, in, particularly in this time, post-industrial uh, uh, world, and, and heritage actually is to make money. So culture becomes a commodity. The very story of these 25 uh, uh, ladies actually become, uh, well, at some point it then has turned into a, a, a cultural commodity that can be sold. It, it is for sale. And I will tell you all about this. So I thought that I would start um, uh, with my presentation uh, to read you the first uh, few uh, uh, two pages of the book and kind of uh, set the tone, right? And this is uh, chapter one, the death of women workers. Um, September 3rd, 1973, began as an ordinary day. The waters of the Kaohsiung Harbor were calm and quiet. In, an, in the early morning, as usual, the Sempen Ferry, right? This ferry uh, uh, at the pier of Zhongzhou Village, which is the small, tiny island, uh, the village that I showed you at the tip of uh, Qijin, the small island, was crowded, overcrowded with passengers on their way to start their workday on the other side of the harbor. Street hawkers, petty vendors, office employees, industrial workers with their baskets of fish, piles of merchandise and bicycles or motorcycles cram the narrow spaces both inside and outside the cabin. It is a very small ferry. Uh, even though the ferry was already jam-packed, anxious young women heading toward the Kaohsiung EPZ export processing zone continued to push their way onto the boat. They could not afford to be late. If they were they would lose the on-time bonus that constituted a large part of their monthly wages. When the engine finally started, the ferry, which officially had the capacity, maximum capacity of 13 passengers, was loaded with more than 70 people, which is not was not unusual. So please don't be surprised at this point. Um, it worked, usually worked. Everything appeared to be normal at first. However, the ferry captain soon discovered that the boat had sprung a leak and was taking on water. He tried to speed up, but the overloaded boat moved cumbersomely and swayed violently. When the ferry was about to reach the pier on the other side, the Kaohsiung side, the captain, the only person working on the boat that day, as it was later discovered, hastily, uh, uh, well, um, hastily tied the boat to a bollard and gestured the passengers to evacuate. This caused an instant surge of confusion and frenzy, as you can imagine, while those standing on the deck were luckily enough to get off the boat right away. Those at the back, or worse, inside the cabin, uh, uh, had to thrust their way through many obstacles, right? including other people's goods, personal vehicles, before they could finally escape the leaking boat. As everyone thrown in the same direction, the boat tilted, dragging down the bollard with it. As a result, the ferry lost its leverage and quickly capsized. 
even though the shore was quite close and Zhongzhou had been a fishing village, not everyone, and especially not all women, knew how to swim. Suddenly, the water was full of people, a sea of panic. Bystanders near the pier of Kaohsiung immediately jumped in uh, uh, to rescue the passengers. Onlookers on the other side, the shore of Zhongzhou, Qijin side, also noticed the calamity. Some quickly joined the rescue effort, while others ran to inform families who might have a member on board the capsized ferry. Amid the chaotic commotion of, poli uh, of police cars, ambulances, first responders, and volunteers were the loud cries and desperate pleas of de de uh, uh, distressed uh, families. It was all over very quickly. The capsized boat sank into deep water in just a few short minutes. Although the rescue crew was able to fish out most of the floating passengers, they were not able to reach those confined in the cabin uh, and, and to rescue them. When the water was calm and quiet again, 46 passengers, young, old, male, female, uh, 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 married, uh, 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 single and married, had been saved, while 25 or unmarried young women between the ages of 13 and 30 had perished. As you can imagine, um, for Taiwanese, this is not simply, of course, we all know that it is a mechanical problem. It is that the, the boat has problems, right? But with uh, 70 passengers, only 25 died, and these 25 were all unmarried young women. This has to be something more than just secular, kind of a regular problem, right? There's something supernatural that is working here. And so that basically sort of is the beginning of the story. Um, now, so, so Taiwanese um, patrilineal culture shuns unweighed female ghosts who do not have a husband's ancestral hall in which to rest in peace. And so this rendered the dead women homeless and potentially vengeful ghosts. And so after the incident happened, and then after a long process of negotiation, compromise, and, um, and then compensation, right? Because these were lives lost. And finally, the families, there, are, there were 22 families and, and, and with these 25 daughters, and two families lost two daughters, one family lost three daughters. And, and the others lost one each, right? So 22 families decided to bury their daughters together. And so what you are seeing here is the 25 men and ladies tomb in Qijin. But uh, this was after, actually is not, oh, this is, oh, this actually was shot in, in early 2000. And this was the first burial of uh, the Maiden Lady's tomb. At first, they were buried at the small corner, very a remote corner of their village, where not much, uh, many people uh, 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 went to. Right? But again, as I told you, this is not just uh, about the story of ghosts. This is also a story about uh, a spatial reconfiguration for the sake of money. So the harbor was to be expanded one more time. So the government decided, okay, all the, this village had to move, right? Uh, living people, dead people, everybody had to move because we need to make way for the harbor. And so the tomb, the tomb actually moved to the current uh, 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 place in 1890, uh, uh, 1989. And at the same time, the government also erected this uh, archway, right? Had uh, stayed 25 maiden ladies tomb in it. And these are the 25 uh, 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 terms. And let me show you a close shot, right? So it, it is arranged and because it is Taiwanese and of Chinese cultural heritage. So it is arranged according to the A characters, right? And everything matters. And, and so a lot of negotiation actually had to happen before they finally decide how to uh, bury each one of these uh, uh, girls or young women. So at the end, the oldest who is, uh, was 30 years old when she died was sitting, is sitting in the middle of the last road and then followed by the second young and oldest and their oldest sort of like this way, right? And so the youngest would, uh, would be uh, sitting by the side. 
Now, I've seen the picture for many, many times, and only today, it, it must be divine, only today I discovered that, that um, how many of you have been in Kaohsiung and sort of know, know the, okay, did you recognize any building, important building? I just realized it today. I can't believe it. This is the 85 Tower, the, the tallest building in Kaohsiung. So it is a very important landmark. And, 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 and it is actually, so if you are living here or you tourists are visiting the city, staying in one of the kind of a hotel room there, then, then you are going to oversee, not, not that you will see here, right? But, but what I want to show you is that, well, there is there was very good reason, good reason for the government wanted to revamp the site because the new site here actually now sits by on the site of a major thoroughfare of Qijin, which is considered uh, by the Kaohsiung city government as important tourist site. And anything ghostly, right? Graveyard, cemetery will have to be cleaned up for it to become a nice, uh, a kind of pleasant uh, tourist destination. So, my very gut feeling is that with or without the story that I'm telling you, the government would will will have would have done something at some point to to clean up this site but but the very story behind it made it even kind of attractive right and 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 then let me continue my story so anyway so so this is what it looks like right and and um Urgent legend actually had it that no young man should ride a motorcycle passing the tomb at night without a backseat passenger, or else he might have an unexpected encounter with one of the ghosts looking for a husband. So this is the, was not the site that Taiwanese would like to go. In 2008, 40 years after the tragic ferry accident, um, at the urge of local uh, uh, feminist communities, the Kaohsiung city government revamp, revamped the burial site and renovated the uh, uh, tomb into the memorial park for women laborers. So, so this was a picture uh, taken in 2020, but the tomb was renovated into a, a park in 2008. Right, so it got rid of all these kind of uh, graveyards and tombstones, all these kind of images, right? And and if you kind of go closely at the center of the park now, uh, 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 sits this statue, which is a blossom, a lotus blossom, and originally, originally the city government actually wants to put this at the center of the park, and this is a public art piece and with 25 uh, separate pieces to indicate 25 uh, lives lost. It's entitled Vessel. Um, and so the time and the date of that incident uh, it was car is carved on each of these uh, 25 pipes, right? And so the Kaohsiung city government all along wanted to get rid of that ghostly association, but it was a long process, which we can come to talk more. So by the end, this was rejected so badly by um, the, uh, 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 the families. They wanted something to indicate the afterlife status of their daughters. And for those, of, uh, 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 those people who know, the 25 urns, right, collected after the removal, removal of the tombstones continue to uh, uh, be stored here. So this continues to be a burial site if you know it. If you don't know it, it looks nice, right? Kind of nice. Okay, and and so this is a sits uh, now sits in the center of the park, and if you also notice that the uh, uh, lotus actually is blossoming, it's not in full blossom, it is blossoming, and the families wanted it that way to indicate the sort of early death, right, untimely death, the state 
of their unmarried daughters and sisters. And so this was, is the epigraph uh, uh, by uh, then Mayor Chen Ju, who herself then was a 50-year-old unmarried woman, followed by the 25 names. So if you go to Kaohsiung now, this is what you are going to see, uh, uh, not the uh, 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 ghostly kind of a picture, uh, the tombs that, that I just show you. Um, so why were the uh, dead buried together in the first place? Why dig them up and overhaul their resting place after all these years? And what impact did their lives and deaths have on those around them? How do communities from form shared memories of the deceased? How are these memories connected with the past, present, and the future? This book is based on my ethnographic research on the change of Gaoshu, in Kaohsiung's built environment as a result of neoliberal economic transformation and concurrent entrepreneurial placemaking strategies of which the reconstruction of this maiden lady's tomb uh, was a part. I examine how the narrative of the deceased women evolved from the time of their deaths uh, when Taiwan had a manufacturing-based economy in the 1970s to the time when the site of their collective burial was renovated into a tourist-friendly public park in post-industrial Taiwan in the early, early 21st century. The history of capitalism, David Harvey writes, is punctuated by intense phases of spatial reorganization, where old spaces are constantly devalued and destroyed, while new spaces are created. So this book uses the transformation of the maiden lady's tomb as an entry point to investigate the shift in the role of women workers from essentially a means of manufacturing production under global industrial capitalism, which was also my previous work, to an emerging focus, uh, focus of cultural production and consumption in today's post-industrial world. Um, the title, Haunting Modernities, conveys the community so, so if there is, I, I think there are two parts of my, my book, right? If, if uh, what I have been telling you is how these 20, the story of the 25 uh, uh, young women when they were alive or when now they are dead fit into this larger process of capital accumulation, right? Global capital accumulation. There's also part that is haunting, right? They are ghosts. So, so I think what attracted me into this story and, and I'm a, trained as a political economist, and so I do care about capital accumulation. But I think what eventually captured my attention, and I really have something to say, I really want to write this book, is really their stories, right? This affective, the emotional side, emotional part that the story of these young women kind of provoke in me, and I hopefully also kind of a, 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 a kind of introduced to my audience. So there is that side, right? So the title, Haunted Modernities, conveys the communicative nature of the relationship between the living and the dead in Taiwan's traditional communities where patrilineal kingship and popular religion are taken deadly seriously. The book engages with the recent debate on the interlocution between haunting and memory and the efficacy of the spectral, right, the ghost, the, 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 the supernatural, in inculcating the complex feelings and experience of loss, disposition, regret, remorse, uh, unfairness, and injustice in mem memorials, monuments, and the vocabulary of everyday expressions. And so these two kind of come together in the book, right, and, and, and make, actually make, the story of them uh, even more sellable. Um, through the various ways that deceased young um, female are perceived to have the potential to interfere in or haunt the living, I illuminate how women workers are envisioned, conceptualized, understood, and propagated in a post-industrial setting where factory jobs are no longer a major source of employment. So three parties of interest were directly involved in the transformation of the maiden lady's tomb, the families of the deceased, the uh, 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 feminist community in Kaohsiung and elsewhere in Taiwan, 
and the Kaohsiung city government as the state actor, right? And so it, they each represented a specific conception of the relationship between the living and the dead. And, and, and so, so what I also am doing is in each of this uh, chapter, and th this is the, the major ethnographic, ethnographic body uh, uh, data of my book, and in each of the chapter, and, and in addition to tell their perspective, and I'm also articulating a particular set of literature a particular set of uh, issue that is important. And I think not only in Taiwan studies, but also in China studies and probably East Asia and globally, right? Kind of a much larger. So, so um, to purge the spectral connotations associated with their deceased uh, 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 daughter, uh, 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 unwed status, that women's uh, parents sought recourse from Taiwanese popular religion uh, uh, to elevate their daughter's afterlife standing from ghosts to goddesses. Um, I think I'm running out of time, uh, but I want to tell you how they do, did it. And this is why it really attracted me. I think anthropologists will love it. This is a ghost story. So of course they love, the point is that these parents love their daughters, right? They really love their daughters. The reason that they can, they couldn't let their daughters come home is because that is the right thing to do, right? They don't want to engender the uh, welfare of the current family members by annoying, irritating ancestors, right? Or the future offspring who probably are not, are not even born yet. But, but sort of a, they cannot afford to do the wrong thing by having somebody who doesn't belong to the ancestral tablet to be home. And so the ancestors may kind of make noise, right? And then, and, and, and then somebody has to pay the price, right? And so, so, but they really love their daughters and these are filial daughters They work so hard for the families, right? So one mother then went to consult with a spirit medium in the village, as you can see, right? So ah, I'm crying, what happened? I really am worried for my daughter. And the spirit medium, of course, is a very good psychologist. And then he says, oh, don't worry. Your daughter now is uh, a serving on the side of Guan Yin, the goddess of mercy. She is uh, uh, learning to become a deity, right? Listen to you. So you can make a god statue, Jin Shen, sort of a god statue for your daughter, because now she is not the unwed ghost. She is a deity to uh, 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 becoming, okay? So then you can welcome her god statue home to worship her, not as your dead daughter, but as a, a possible deity, right? So that totally, culturally, legitimately transform the status of this uh, dead woman. And, and so, so it's very interesting. And then it elevated the daughters from ghosts to goddesses. Um, and so that, that is that, right? And I'm going to speed up. <laughs> In contrast, Kaohsiung's feminist community fought to remove the stigma attached to unwed ghosts by waging public campaigns to promote the deceased women as valued members of the industrial workforce vital to the national economic development and by pushing the state to revamp the environment of their collective burial in their honor. These are heroines. They, they are harrowing, national harrowings. The specters of the young women had to be exorcised to correct the historical wrongs and transcended to be champions for a more just society. Kaohsiung is Taiwan's industrial hub and was until recently a world-class container port. The fortunes of the city changed following the shifting global economic environment and Taiwan's new role as an industrial capital exporter. As the focus of Taiwan's export has matured and specialized in the 21st century, Kaohsiung can no longer rely on uh, the industrial sector for its urban economy. The Kaohsiung city government therefore responded to the feminist call to memorialize the dead by remaking the site into the visitor-friendly memorial park for women labor as part of the broader post-industrial makeover of the city. 
the ghost of the deceased young workers and the very kind of a story, right? Beautiful story, sad, beautiful story were transformed in this context to symbolize the new progressive forward-looking identity of Kaohsiung City. Now, so this is a map of Qijin, right? And then next time, if you get a chance to go to, go to Kaohsiung, then you will see that the Kaohsiung City basically tried to come from, this is a Taiwan Strait, uh, 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 transform the uh, kind of uh, the seashore site into all these kind of Instagram spots that you can take good pictures, okay? And 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 in between, I'm going to show you that the Memorial Park actually is here. And then when you go there, even after today, you probably will will pass by because it really simply is insignificant. It doesn't look well good, and it's not going. You're not going to take beautiful pictures and to be posted on Instagram. It's a very continue to be a very humble site, but nonetheless, in the larger context of thing, right? You sort of see what the Kaohsiung City tries to do here. Now, so this is uh, my table content, and let me just kind of continue. So. How do I kind of draw all these together? Urban space is a ma material representation of feelings, images, and thoughts. By advancing their notions of female labor through proposals for the collective burial, the involved parties were also forging their specific account of history and in so doing, transforming the burial site into various versions of heritage, and each with distinctive political and cultural effects. In spite of their various associations with haunting, the involved parties all display deep sympathy towards the tragic early death of the 25 young women. They also capitalize on this sympathy uh, for their goals, right? And so here, To explain why the story behind the Maiden Lady's Tomb evokes such strong emotions, I invoke the concept of industrial structural feeling. So that is the affect part, right? Understood as the sentiments, thoughts, and feelings grounded in daily experience and embodied presence that in turn informed and constructed the way of life of industrial workers and their communities. And, and this book argues that the employment of neophyte women workers ushered in a new way of organizing daily routine and the new reality of everyday experiences. The loss of working daughters' lives, therefore, entails not only financial and emotional tolls, but also the shattering of one's sense of meaning and continuity. Okay? And, 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 so I was hoping to play you the song, uh, Long Girl's Dream. Uh, but uh, if you are interested uh, in Chinese, it's Go Lue Guan Mong. It is a Taiwanese song and, and written. It's a Japanese song, but then and the lyrics it was sort of a composed by uh, uh, into Chinese, right? Taiwanese by Ye Jin Lin and, and the same song by by a singer who was nine years old at that time, not much, uh, not much younger, yeah, not much younger uh, 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 than the workers, uh, many of the workers. And so I, I can play it, but we don't have time anyway. <laughs> so, so let me conclude, Trey, and I will leave time. Ultimately, what I try to do here is that. Women workers uh, can be a crucial signifier with or without a corporal body to labor. The significance of women workers in real life and theoretically is manifested in two interrelated ways, right? And they're sort of my two parts, two strong uh, story. First, the economic contributions of women workers are not always derived from their productive roles, but also from the symbolic capital they help to create as icons uh, in post-industrial culture-led urban economies, right? And this in turn highlights the fact that women workers are all become icons, not only because of their uh, economic contributions, but also because surrounding their productive activities, a way of social life is formed and a structure of feeling and a sense of collective identity are forged. I will stop here and then, and, and Thank you.
first, I just wanted to say thank you so much for a, a writing a wonderful book and then giving us this presentation of it. Um, and also to Taiwan Studies and, and, and James Lin for inviting me to be in conversation with you today. I think the first thing I want to say is, is, is really just an um, appreciation for the book. It's so exemplary in the way that it focuses on one event and one location. Um, and suddenly opens up across mm -hmm. time and space um, of both the ways that there's been a kind of a, a continual return and reassessment of this event, but also in the way that you um, focus on the, the intimate and the, the public emotions over decades, um, you really also give us this history of, of Taiwan, um, like this long durée of, of Taiwanese history mm -hmm. focused in Kaohsiung, um, that is, you know, you're thinking at this moment of the localization, <laughs> which was the word that people were trying to think about in about globalization. And you're helping us understand how those processes happened um, in Taiwan and in Kaohsiung, but not just in the Taiwan miracle, because in your book, you take us all the way back to the Qing dynasty, to the opium wars, like through, you know, Japan and Taiwan, and then these different political moments. And I think at every, the way in which you take this, this what could be seen as a, a singular and, you know, perhaps not completely, you know, exceptional event and just open it up mm -hmm. um, it, it is really amazing, especially in the way that you help us see the conjuncture of um, patrilineal ideology and capitalist logic. Um, as kind of at, at every juncture of these turns, the way in which women's labor um, is serving particular ends. Um, and often it's right subjugated to a, a national effort or um, to their vital energy is flowing out, you know, also to the family, to, you know, their brothers, to their parents, to building the family that sometimes, you know, they're the ones who are are, are this vital energy that's that's being pulled away from them towards these other projects. So I think the way you show the conjunction of that working is, is really um, quite amazing because it helps us see not just in Taiwan, but in other parts of the world and the ways mm -hmm. in which then women's labor, here it's the specifics of patrilineality, patrilocality, patriarchy in a particular kind of social context, but how women's labor um, at these different social cultural conjunctions with capitalist logic makes it flexibilized, makes it temporary, um, often makes it young, like young right. women working. Um, and we see that in factories, as you note in there, you know, across the world again and again. Um, as an ethnographer, I just also <laughs> want to give a lot of appreciation. I think one of the things I try to teach my students about ethnography is that this very heterogeneous kind of um, mode of doing research and writing. And yours is also that that crosses scales. So the same way that you're crossing scales and trying to get us to understand the, the sadness and the haunting of families. And then also across time, how feminist activists take it up and also how a city government takes it up um, and how different families are actually negotiating their loss and mm -hmm. the, 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 un, the unrest, the restlessness of the ghosts that can't be properly right, settled until they find a way that also the families themselves are coming up with yeah. some different solutions Change. sometimes um, that um, in that um, I think you're, you, you are doing that, this, this work of thinking across those scales, but also doing that work as an ethnographer across those scales. So the kinds of inf heterogeneous information that is included in the, the book, I just, for those of you who haven't read it, I really urge you to read it because it's really beautifully constructed where you're, you're getting us to think about, you know, labor wages and statistics and, you know, they had to get on that boat because they needed to get their on-time bonus, like all of these structural issues, but also the ways in which you talk with the families um, and you think about that and you take ghosts seriously because it is um, you know, that's one of the things I learned. They are serious. They are right? real. That, that any kind of attention that's given to any 
um, yeah. you know, supernatural yeah. being yeah. in a social context isn't to be dismissed because it's not objective or scientific, <laughs> but that in the like, kind yeah. of private and public yeah. emotions that are throwing, flowing through all of different kind of social collectivity of the ways that people are haunted by them, like their families who've borne this unbearable loss that they're trying to you know, make peace mm -hmm. with in some way, but also the gossip like on local college campuses, don't go by there at night, all of the ways <laughs> that the stories stay, and actual stories of people, you know, who feel that their, their younger sister who died, their ghost, you know, is mm -hmm. trapped in places and they see them and they hear them and they speak with them. So I, the way that you take that seriously, I think is, is really important because it, it, it mm -hmm. shows how it's a, uh, a site that can continually be revivified and different sorts of things can be layered through it. Um, so just appreciation for all of those things. I thought that I might, um, I have, I think, three main questions that we can maybe <laughs> think through some themes. And I, I wanted to start um, maybe on a larger scale of just thinking about memorial sites and, and mm -hmm. sites of, uh, because, lots of parts of the world have been thinking about right these statues that have been erected and when do we keep them up and when do we take them down or when do we you know remake them or move them to another place um and it feels like it's like uh, a continual negotiation of different kinds of cosmologies of, of what's appropriate right. what's right at this right. moment yeah. um and also, I, it, it, when it's memorialization of untimely death, it's also a cosmological negotiation between the living and, and the dead. Yeah. And so I thought I would just, um, I just wanted to share a very small story about a site that's close to here as maybe a way of opening up a conversation with you about how do we think with these sites and, and mm. keep them mm. al alive rather than like, closed and settled mm -hmm. and therefore sealed mm -hmm. from any way in which the the, the voices mm -hmm. of the, the ghosts can still get mm -hmm. us to think in new kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a statue, there was a statue, there's a, a peace park very close to campus. Is it that direction? Yeah. Yes, that direction. It's, it's quite small. Um, and it, it, had, um, a, it had a statue there of um, a young, I should preface this first. Since I'm the chair right now of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, I was asked several, a couple of years ago by some reporters, uh, because it was Women's History Month, um, about to respond to this, like they had discovered the scandalous thing that there are very few public statues or monuments to women in all of Seattle. Mm -hmm. And one of the very few was this statue of a young Japanese girl whose name was Sadako Sasaki, who had um, this been exposed during the um, the bombing of Hiroshima at the end of World War II um, and died of leukemia at the age of 12. And so mm -hmm. there's a Quaker group here um, who had erected a statue of her, a peace statue, mm -hmm. um, also partly thinking about the, the history of Japanese American internment during World mm -hmm. War II mm -hmm. here. And um, just some months ago, um, the statue disappeared. Somebody cut her off at the ankle. So all that remains now are her mm -hmm. feet, which are also kind of walking, you know, they're in movement and there, it's a mystery. Nobody knows why um, mm -hmm. she was disappeared. So I guess I just wanted to use that as a, a, a site that feels really like an open wound right now that's very close to campus mm -hmm. um, to think through mm -hmm. your thinking about um, memorial sites. Mm -hmm. And I think especially what you do, in some ways, I was trying to think through this with mm -hmm. your book. I think what your book, because there's always the danger of, right, it becomes sealed. Suddenly there's the end story of what we're right. memorializing right. and then it's just captured and there's there's no more right. haunting that makes us think in new right. ways and consider what were the social injustices then and now right. that we need to keep thinking about the structures that we live in. So I was wondering, just with that big picture of the work that you did, and I think your book itself, Right. keeps the site alive in a way that maybe a tourist walking by it right. uh, on the waterfront there right. might not experience it that way. But I was wondering if you had any thoughts, thoughts. to share about what, what do we do with these? How do we attend to them in our daily lives? Because we do walk by these kinds of locations, locations all the time. Yeah. 
And so I've just been thinking about the question, that question a lot. And then it, you, you yeah. bring it up in such, you know, really uh, interesting and amazing ways. In your okay. Talk. And I think, I, I, I do think, I mean, I think theoretically for feminist uh, 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 scholars, particularly that in sort of a, what, like you said, when we have a memorial site, it means a closure, right? So it's active forgetting. It's like, like, right, like memorializing actually is kind of a forgetting because you close, enclose the story, you give it a step first mean, meaning, right? And I, I did think a lot about that. And then, and then, and then, so, so I did articulate that sort of a, in the theoretical part, but I think to address what you say though, I mean, nobody really pays much attention to the to the new park, mm -hmm. except for the government. And every year they promised the families to give a memorial service, right? and they did, because that's a good thing to do as a good government, right? So they did that. But I think the story lives on, and I do strongly I feel strongly about it. Is that, and and I think they, there there's different. Um, it, it's just like things come together, sort of in a very good way that Taiwan is uh, promoting um, gender equity education. I'm sorry, I think I'm butchering the name, but but it, it, it sort of a, it multiple, mo, mo, multiplicity of gender, plurality of gender and sexuality is a very important thing at least. It's not only a lip service because there's a lip legislation by the Taiwanese government. So every campus, college or high school has to, either really serious doing it or just kind of do it kind of a lip service, but they have to provide some kind of educational courses and curriculum to this on, on gender issue. And, and so it becomes a very good kind of a platform continuing a, a, a kind of ongoing memorialization of this particular event because like the uh, the particular university I wrote about it's, it's uh, National Sun Yat-sen University Zhongshan Dashu which just sits next to the island very close to the uh, uh, ferry pier and 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 then the uh, professors then uh, then incorporate this particular incident and the whole process right renovation process into their curriculum so year after year after year they are actually teaching it so so in a way it's sort of like you are memorializing in an ongoing uh, process and but it also changes depending on who's teaching it who are listening to the story and and then the, how students think about it right so i think that 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 and then and, and that chapter i call it be, beyond memorial i think i was trying to capture exactly that that possibility that well the memorial is one thing but whether we can use that memorial as uh, for pedagogical purpose can probably be a more important uh, a possibility for us or for the future generations to continue to think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. No, I, well, it makes us all as educators feel like that is that's we probably what do we do. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah think, is thinking yeah. about how to bring yeah, our students yeah. into rethinking those sites think, and right. how are they, how do they help us understand the past, but also keep Cheap. the question from them alive. Right into the future. future. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was also really uh, fascinated by what you call um, haunting as methodology or spectra politics, um, and 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 I guess it's in the taking of um, the voices of the dead and of ghosts quite yeah. seriously. There's all of the different ways that you talk about the kind of social collectivity of how people yeah. mm -hmm. are called to feel something or do something by mm -hmm. these voices of the dead. And I, it, it's that song that you had up there. That was a really moving piece. Oh, you play the... Oh, I haven't heard it, but the way you, uh, you oh, know, the, the lyrics the, the are lyrics. in there that you talk about, you know, older professional men. So when they hear <laughs> that song, they just burst into tears, tears because for them, it's a reminder of the outflow of vital energy and labor of their sisters who maybe did not pursue education as they did, but worked in certain capacities that assisted them to, to yeah. move on in their career. So I, there was that, that one part of like how yeah. this voice speaks even across the generations of what 
what the kinds of, you know, mm. the love that they had, but also the recognition of the kinds of sacrifices mm. and maybe inequalities even mm -hmm. in the ways that yeah. uh, kinship gendered yeah. and responsibilities in the family. So this question, I don't know. I was just <laughs> thinking about the classic Gayatri Spivak question of can the subaltern speak? And I have never thought of the subaltern as the dead or as a ghost. And so I was just trying to think with that idea of, you know, if the voice keeps speaking of the of the ghosts of the of yeah. the the young women who died in 1973, yeah. I think you do it in the book, but I don't know if there is a way to kind of say like what are they saying through whom over different yeah. you know time periods, and is it a consistent message? Because they don't always. This not no, it doesn't feel like, settled, no, right? No. Like there's the spirit medium to provide a way to say like this is how you can make them into a god, and then. Every, the, the history is sealed, but I don't know if there's there, any other way. Your question it. makes me think you're sort of like, oh, is this suddenly a lot of things? But but it's interesting because um, what one thing immediately sort of struck me is that it's it's oh my god, a professor a professor uh, uh, <laughs> Sasha is talking about uh, particularly chapter three, right? But the title I, I name it is Filial Daughters and Pious Ghosts. Because they are quiet, mm. they don't talk. Actually, they mm -hmm. are very good daughters. They right. were very good daughters, right? Good daughters don't talk back, right? Good daughters just do. After they die, they are pious ghosts because they also don't come back to really haunt their families. But the potential is always there, right? Living people are afraid. Oh, what if they come back to haunt us? But they actually didn't. They kind of did. Did in the sense that, oh, I enter my mother's dream saying, oh, I really, I, I mean, are you, I, I, I think in, in, in the book, I, I did talk about when the mother talks about how their daughter comes back into the dream. It says, oh, my daughter is so filial, right? Mm -hmm. And she comes back to, to see whether we are doing well. She just wants to make sure that we are okay. And she would sleep kind of lie on, uh, next to me, well, in dream, right? And then just make sure that I'm okay. So all along, these are not evil mm -hmm. female ghosts or that they are they were not looking for a husband they were not coming back because they were really unhappy they they really cared about their family so they continue to come back and so they are silent and they actually i mean having said that they have their god statues being made and none of them really made into gods because for those who are familiar with taiwanese pop religion uh you know it's a kind of a you, you have to have marvel you have to have you have to, you have, you have uh, to do magics, right? And in order for you to be recognized by the public that you are really powerful, you are a, a good god, you are doing good for everybody. So we worship you, and then you can become a public god. Right? Public is very important. Whereas if I say I claim that okay, I'm a god, okay, worship me, and my my students probably are coerced into worshiping me, so that really doesn't count because I haven't done good things to uh, benefit the, the society, the community at large, right? And so these are quiet ghosts. Mm -hmm. They really never spoke. But I think what you said actually made me think that their quiet, their, their silence, their quietness actually exactly uh, exemplifies their virtue, right? As good daughters when they were alive. And so they just did what they needed to do. They knew this is what they had to do for their families and they they accepted it mm -hmm. and they did it well. And then unfortunately they died, they still accepted it. They didn't make troubles. So the very silence actually exactly mm -hmm. is part of their virtue, I think. And which probably makes mm -hmm. kind of the parents would feel or the brother would feel even more they owe them something. Mm -hmm. But but I, having said that, owe them something though, I, I think um, uh, uh, there is this part of a social contract, right? I think, I think in, I mean, if everything goes well, right? And you, you everything goes well that you are a young daughter and sister, you works for your family, right? And you are paying back the debts that you owe your parents because they raised you until the day you marry out and become somebody's wife and wife and, 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 and daughter-in-law labor for another family, right? So, so you are a daughter, a married daughter. You work for your NATO families. 
you marry, right? And you move into and become part of your husband's families, right? You bear sons, children, but preferably sons, right? And then you change your roles, right? And meanwhile, your husband's own unwed sisters probably are laboring for the welfare of you, right? And your husband and his family, right? And so now you have a son, right? And you become a mother, right? And so you are totally incorporated into the ancestral hall of your husband's family, right? And then after you die, then you have your male offspring to worship you. So if, if everything goes well, right? This is sort of latent gratification. You can you can critique it. There's certainly gender inequality here. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. But there is also a social contract in the minds of everybody that, well, every step of the time, the compensation comes later, right? When you become a mother, a mother-in-law, and you died as somebody's mother and mother-in-law, right? And, and then, so that is the social contract. And what we are seeing here is that the contract is broken, right? They didn't get a chance to live through the later stage. It's here. Their lives get, got cut short, right? And I think a lot of the emotions, they, they really love them. But I, I think there is also this, like, we, we, the social contract was broken. It has to be patched. It has to be kind of a, amended. And how, how are we going to amend it, I think, is very much kind of a... You say it's both effective and I think social, I think, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it is not, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting maybe that these quiet ghosts have actually caused such public um, spaces. Oh, that's my, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then layers of how do we interpret the yeah. goodness and the untimeliness and sometimes it yeah. seems like also the injustice of their deaths because there were all these things wrong some of them weren't even old enough to be working in the factory in the export no. zone right. and then their families didn't get compensation because they weren't legally employed so um, yeah it's just it's interesting yeah it's so interesting that they were that you they're quiet ghosts and yet yeah. have a, a long kind of afterlife that's being rethought again and again yeah, yeah. Which maybe brings me to my just very last thing that is in relation <laughs> to your epilogue. No, it's not epilogue. a hard question. I, um, I just I, I'm teaching gender and sexuality in China this quarter. I think a couple of the students from the class are here. And uh, early in the quarter, we read Huyen Jun's On the Revenge of Women. She was an anarchist feminist from 1907, oh, cool. and she. Um, was trained in the Confucian tradition, so she knew how to take the oh, Confucian tradition down yeah, step by yeah, step. Yeah. And so one of the things in this essay on the revenge of women, she talks about the inscription of an inequality through rites and rituals. And one of the places she says is in funerary rites, um, is the ways in which inequality between men and women is inscribed in, in funeral yeah. customs and rites. Yeah. So I, um, and you're in the, 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 in, yeah, I think it's chapter seven, seven and maybe epilogue a little bit. I'm trying to remember. Um, you talk about how this it's it's um, not just a memorial site, but it's also memorial practices and a, a repertoire. Yeah. And that part of what's moved beyond the park or the burial site is these yeah. other questions. And some of them were actually about funeral practices and um yeah. And and gendered and also questions about how LGBTQ, um, right. right, if you have changed your, um, right, assigned um, sex, like right. how all of these things work right. in the afterlife. And so I just wondered if you might be able to say a few words about how you close out in thinking about the ongoing <laughs> repertoire of people's work through funerary customs and rights to change them. If you are, if you are students, if, if you are interested in doing this project, the LGBTQ is a very interesting issue, like how, how they can be incorporated into this kind of a traditional binary system, right? Mm -hmm. And I think actually there are a few dissertations on this topic because mm -hmm. because it's really interesting like mm -hmm. how how you're going to incorporate them i did write a lot about funerals i i hate funerals i'm so afraid of ghosts um, um but but um i think oh yeah the the some initiative actually came from the government i mean in some way taiwanese government is pretty progressive 
well, being forced to be progressive mm -hmm. by progressive feminists, um, but they, they're doing it. So they, they try to, through, through the uh, mortuary, the mortician, Morticians, right? Morticians, those uh, those people who help the deceased families to arrange the funeral process. Here is the funeral director, I guess, right? And then in Taiwan is mortician, and they, they there is a license process, right? So by changing the day, the questions, by changing the exam, right, the government actually is steering the direction of what is the right ritual that you have to do in funerals, right? You sort of see see that it's in a way like 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 this is the right answer right and you just memorize the right answer so instead of uh, having only sons to carry the most important like you know the um the um the incense the, you know, what you, the, the pot incense pot right traditionally it is the government said no 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 no. if you say only males can do that you're not going to get your license okay you have to say both genders can do that. So by doing so, they actually are, I think, very intentionally uh, training the next generation of morticians to be gender, have that gender consciousness. And it's just very interesting. So we are seeing that uh, the, the, the changes gradually. But I think I think it's just like in, in China, when you have a, a, a very disproportionate uh, a ratio of men to women, things have to change right in taiwan taiwan is one of the societies uh, that have uh, one of the lowest uh, fertility rates that is below replacement that is where well, a couple a couple well a couple two people don't don't produce only produce one or less fewer people so the society is shrinking right so if if you don't have only one child or you have no children at all your child cannot be guaranteed to be a boy right so a lot of families actually have girls daughters only and what are you going to do the the social structure is 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 like that and you just simply don't have enough sons to carry all this kind of a proper traditional rituals and so so I think the, the society is forced to change as well. So I think, I guess from my perspective, they are moving into the right direction. And I think your anarchist is so, it's, it's like a prophet because <laughs> she, well, a hundred years ago, she's, for, she's, seeing, she's seeing it. And I think, and for many Taiwanese feminists, they do see the afterlife is the last frontier mm -hmm. of feminist movement, mm -hmm. unless the, these re, kind of a patrilineal leaning customs, cultural beliefs being changed, particularly the afterlife kind of beliefs. If it's not changed, then their task is not completed. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Oh, for thank you so book. much. The question is, uh, is it a tradition for Taiwanese families to regard their uh, dead daughters as ghosts or not? Traditionally, yes. Because, and I do emphasize traditionally, yes, because Taiwan's uh, Taiwanese kingship system is patrilineal kingship system in the sense that only male descendants are real descendants and, and women have to be married out to join their husband's families in order to become a permanent members of a family. Right. And so I'm married, so I'm fine. My problem is that I don't have a son, so I'm in trouble. Right. But if if a woman is not married, then then traditionally, then there is a sort of a it's 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 almost I mean, and then for those those who know about other cases, please uh, 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 tell us after I kind of explain this. Um, so 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 women's. We, when we, when a woman is alive, traditionally, she has to, she's not, she's a temporary member of her father's family. She will become a, a permanent member of her husband's family, right? After she dies. So if she is not married, then she has no place to go home because, because the family, she cannot go back to her father's family she is supposed to join somebody's family who is her husband so unmarried women are caught uh, deceased unmarried women are caught in this kind of a conundrum that they they have no place to go back to and then and i emphasize traditionally because you say that i then i don't believe that right so i don't believe that so it doesn't matter and i do agree with that if if a sort of a society does 
evolve, does evolve, right? Is evolving. So, so, so it is a belief system, and it is also practice. If you don't do it, then you don't do it, right? But I think, I think, and this is how I would see it. Um, and a, a larger issue here is that I, for example, um, let me use myself as example. Uh, so let's say. Uh, my unmarried aunt, right? For example, my my father's uh, uh, sister, unmarried aunt, who passed away. James. James is a male, so he he's more important. Women are not important. So James James has an an, an unmarried aunt who passed away, right? And James' father or James are very progressive and says that we have no problem. Uh, we will come our aunt to come back home, right? So so you know the ancestor worship is that even after you die, you have to be housed, you have to eat food, you have to occasionally have pocket money to spend, right? And you have to to be able to enjoy life just like when you are alive. So who is offering you that? Then it's your descendants, the male descendants who are supposed to do that, right? That, that's the whole point here. But then let's say James is very progressive and she's saying, oh, he has, I have no problem. My aunt can come home. But then the issue is that it's not just about him or his uh, in, in, in nuclear family, right? Kinship system is a large web of relations. So the matter can be James, uh, a great, great, great father or great, great, great mother then is not happy that James say, Okay, my married aunt can come to join this uh, uh, pathion of my ancestors because all the other ancestors are no, we are not happy about that. So you don't you don't know what they will do, right? It sounds it sounds crazy, but think about it. You don't know what they will do. Do you think James uh, and, and is so brave that he's willing to take on the possibilities that his ancestors may be angry? <laughs> So, so it, it becomes a, a, a much larger issue than I am willing, right? Because you are, he is carrying the welfare of his current family, his, the pleasure or the mood of his ancestors who may be angry and then do something to his current family and future offspring, right? So it can happen at any moment because because ap the afterlife is eternal, kind of the timeline is eternal. So 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 you have to sort of so determined that you can bear all these consequences, then you can do it. So I think a lot of people probably will stop short because they are not sure what will what might may happen. And this is Taiwanese popular religion. And so if you are Christian or you are Buddhist in Taiwan, then you probably don't share this the cosmology, then you are off the hook. But for most Taiwanese who live in this uh, uh, kind of a, a popular religion, which is also a culture, right? Then you, 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 you think very seriously about what you will do because it's not just you, it is <laughs> this large web of, uh, social relations that you are responsible. My question is just more on um, the transformation of that, that um, uh, site. For, so now we know that the cultural government had transformed that into a female workers memorial park. park right. And before that, it, it was a shrine that has the 20, 25 uh, female workers tombs. Um, what are the responses of the reactions by, by the, the families? When they, yeah. when the government are in, or consult them or inform them that we're going to do this in the yeah. park, and what are the public re reactions to that? Because if I know, if I were a tourist knowing nothing and going to a park, then I realize <laughs> this was a tomb, then I might be shocked rather than more being memorial to, you know, the the, yeah. the astros and ancestors who really pay. Uh, the tribute to, I mean, to really, really did the yeah, labor work yeah. for, for our uh, in, industrial miracles. Thank so you. I wonder how is the public reaction and the family's reaction to this transformation? Yeah. Thank you. I'll say the public reaction first. So what I'm tell what I told you is be between these walls. Okay, don't go out to tell everybody that the twenty five urns is still there because it's not good. <laughs> it, I, <laughs> You are right. I, I, um, I'm not sure. I don't think the public knows that um, 
it continues to be the sort of the burial site of, of these women, right? Because because it's a park. Um, but then last time when I was uh, presenting my book talk, one of my colleagues I started Googling, it's like, like just a memorial park for women laborers. And, and you, you probably can do it now. And he continued to find a lot of like, oh, girls are still there. <laughs> so <laughs> It, it, it's going, uh, it's not going strong, but I think, I think it's so prevalent. I think it's, it's just so important to Taiwanese, this particular kind of a cultural understanding and belief. And then, then, then some people still see it as, as the way they would see it, even if there's, yeah. But I think most, for the most part, young people, who just go there for a day of fun and they just pass by it's like, oh that's the tour man well, that's the park and then because it's not beautiful now for instagram and I'm, I'm serious this part i'm really serious um as as to the family it's interesting and then and, and i i have chapter six right supernatural beings that martin is it's exactly to talk about the, the negotiation between the families and and the states because before right the first three chapters is like we this is what we think right it's all discursive it's it's a kind of the fight in language and a fight in the public kind of opinions. But when it gets to the, the nitty gritty of how we're going to do it, then it's really between the government and the families. And and I mean, Taiwanese, got, however, kind of a, uh, what's the word, modernist a Taiwanese government, any level of Taiwanese government is, and they still are concerned about ghosts because Again, their voters are concerned about ghosts, right? So they will have to concern about ghosts, right? And I think the Taiwanese officials are also Taiwanese. So they kind of shared that, that kind of who knows what they will do if we don't do something they like, right? And, and but it's interesting that Professor Lee say that because for the Taiwan, for the families, their first they actually wanted to transform the, the 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 tomb into not a park, but some temple. You sort of hear this, right? Some temple, like uh, 18 Lords Temple in northern Taiwan. Temple in in Taiwanese, uh, Chinese is Shiba Wang Gong Miao, and that that uh, uh, worships uh, 17 uh, 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 sa sailors. Their bones, uh, bodies washed. Of I mean, on shore, and so nobody knew the identity of these seventeen sailors, right? Plus their dog. So the eighteenth lord, eighteenth lord, actually is the dog. The dog is very loyal, the most efficacious one, actually. But together, it's eighteen lords, right? So these are ghosts because they have no families. Nobody knows who they are, right? They are just like bones on the roadside and being collected. And then, in order to pacify them, then Taiwanese built a temple. But but then. For many reasons, and, and, and I'm going to skip that part, but anyway, the temple becomes a very popular temple, right? A lot of uh, uh, people then go uh, kind of uh, seek help from these, these ghosts, they continue to ghost, right? And not that these 25, 22 families see their daughters as really like homeless ghosts in that regard, but the ghostly nature is similar, right? Sort of like these are these 25 women, even though we say they are gods, but like I told you, they are really not, they, they haven't done any kind of magic things. So, you know, the community is saying, yeah, yeah, whatever, you can say whatever you want, right? And 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 so so um the families actually wanted to do that. And and then and 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 so they think that if you have a temple like that then Taiwanese will come to start worshiping, right? And that is the way they want. And But from the government's perspective, well, no way. We will never do that. So so that sort of a kind of a never happened. Yeah. And it, it's a very long process of negotiation. And at the end, of course, the families got very little of what they wanted. And the government basically did most of what they wanted as, as usual. So, yeah. One question from online. This is a good question, uh, or an interesting question. Was posthumous marriage ever considered for these women? Oh, yeah. Um, in, in Taiwanese sub religion, or Chinese actually, I should say, there is this ghost marriage 
that is uh, a parent a parents will find with i mean it, it doesn't matter it's a son deceased son or deceased daughter right the uh i'm, I'm, I'm sort of explaining the, the the custom first right so ghost marriage involves that parents are looking for kind of a, 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 a person who is willing to marry their deceased son or deceased daughter and and oh and, and netflix actually has a taiwanese that drama tv dramas exactly on this issue he's a gay and oh it's interesting i don't know i'll find the so anyway and usually what uh, the parents would do is kind of a, have uh, something a kind of a red envelope and they throw it on the roadside right and with uh, the deceased the hair or whatever inside and then it's like james again right james is a kind of a innocent uh, a present uh, on uh, looker and he's like, oh cool and pick it up and then oh you are the chosen one and so if he's willing and oftentimes the person who who kind of got chosen is willing because the person is doing a good deed right for a deceased person and james oh, i know he's married right? but if he is not and he can go on to marry a real i mean living person and lives a fulfilled lives as usual but having a kind of a a, a deceased uh, a first wife right and so it's a good thing and so and 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 that that is i think what the question is about no these are good daughters so only one i think ever being said that it's not even the one who came back to say that uh, she wanted to have a husband it's actually and it sounds like oh yeah come on you are kidding me but but somebody living in another county then suddenly show up at Xi Jinping's uh, uh, district office saying that, oh, a woman came into my dream saying that she is looking for a husband and she wants me to be her husband. I don't know who she is, but so I come to seek help. Do you know this? who this woman is? And it sounds really crazy, but then the Xi Jinping district office helped to find this woman amount the 25 and then for whatever reason we didn't interview we didn't get the chance to interview the father the father say no and so after that basically the father didn't approve this marriage after that the the girl never came back so these 25 are very good daughters and they they just listen to their father wow yeah and never never asked for anything i, I really not if you really feel sorry for them it's like yeah yeah so one more question from online, and then we'll go back to our in-person audience. This is from Chris Chen. So um, Chris was just here a few months ago. Thanks for your talk, Anru. I'm curious about the artwork, uh, the vessel. How was the original artist or artwork selected, and who created the lotus-shaped replacement memorial artwork? Oh, thank you. Um, the the In Taiwan, uh, any major construction it's like 1% kind of a New York subway has public art, right? So any public construction has to uh, uh, allocate a certain percentage of the construction cost for public art. <coughs> and so Taiwan also has that oh. policy. And so this, well, is a major public construction. So, so I think the city government used that money and to solicit a, a public art. And, and 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 speaking of procedure, uh, and it can be an open competition, right? People here can say, oh, "I'm going to submit my work," and it's open competition. Or the city government can choose to to have a selective, like, "Oh, okay, you please apply, please apply, please apply." We will choose from uh, one uh, between you, right? And that is another possibility. And or the government can say, uh, "Well, usually that, that is not happening." So, oh, okay, James Lee is so worldly famous, we really want his work, right? And I think in this case, they probably. I don't know. That's a good question, but I know that that the government cannot just couldn't just say they didn't just say that we want this work. I think it was there is a public process for that, um, and and so that that is that, um, and then the uh, the lotus actually came from one of the brothers because many of the parents uh, 
have passed away at this point, and we did our research 10 years ago. So at that time, many of them were really aging. So brothers, generation of brothers started to take mm -hmm. over, right? So one of the brothers who really want her, his sister to be recognized publicly as a god. Um, so you kind of see that some families really kind of really want this to happen, right? Because, because, and 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 then so I think one particular brother and and then and gave the idea and insisted on uh, having a lotus as opposed to the vessel, and and then I think the government just kind of go went along with that. Yeah, it's a small concession. So Ellen is asking about guilt. You know, does guilt enter into the conversation, um, or is it mostly focused on like honor or the other? Yeah. things that you were discussing <clears throat> it's a thank you it, it's a tough question in the sense that um explained what happened right after right so so um the when it happened it was considered as a failure of public safety Okay. And this island had no, can, at that time, it had only this private run. I, I should say the, the private, private like run ferry, uh, and 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 so over, overseen by the government, but private run, and and so right after, it's very interesting that for a very long time, at that point, everybody saw the incident as a failure of public safety. Even 40 years later, right, when we went back to interview some of the families, they continued to say that, oh, the contribution, hear, hear the language, the contributions of our daughters is to earn the island across, uh, across Harbor Tunnel. So they continue to focus on the transportation like issue, right? And so that that then is solved and because right after the Cross Harbor Tunnel con that connecting Chijin and Kaohsiung was built. But that is because export process zone is on the other side. So it's very important, right? Again, the money speaks. But anyway, that is done. And and then on the other side, then the government started uh, 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 provided, uh, it's just you're providing service, public ferry service with bigger boat, uh, better oversight, right? And so, so that happened. And for a very long time, I think even today, when you go back, when at that time, there was no labor standards law yet, but there were laws regulating laborers. But but do keep this in mind, and this is sort of a, a kind of a, a nagging point between me and my collaborator, Professor Tong, at the National Shen University, and and I I am more sympathetic to the context under which these the people at that time had to live their lives in a particular way. What I'm saying is that well. It, it was a it was a time when Taiwan was poor in general. There were not that many uh, employment opportunities. Industrial employment uh, was one of the most important and most stable income, and then for families, this Chijin is a is island is island, right? So many families relied on fishing, which was so unreliable and uncertain. So so at that time, you <laughs> this is this sounds awful, but if you are poor. You really don't have that much choice, okay? And then, and then, and so, so of course, do you think that these families know that their daughters worked really hard? Do you think they don't know that their families, and their daughters probably didn't, would, could be, could have been paid a little bit more? But then, given the situation, they endured, right? They sort of endured, and these daughters, these women. They, of course, they see the, the wearing out of their bodies. They know that. Every day they they are like dragging their very worn out body home. They, of course they know that. But but do you can you is is there other option? I mean, was there other option at that point? Probably not, right? So so I think at that moment, this really sounds awful, but the people were endured and they they did what they needed to do in order to get by and started to build a better life, which essential, eventually, essentially, with the sort of economic takeoff and the society becomes more affluent and then generation after generation they did kind of become the lives become easier and better so so at that time there was no people knew that some violations been being done but we kind of swallow it now when they look back it's like 
it is a time that this is how we did things. And it's not fair, but I think it's just sort of like this very paradoxical situation. But at times, oftentimes, we just have to kind of accept it and live it, I think. Let us give one more round of applause for Professor Lee. Thank you so much. For Thank you very much.